still have the Jimmy, and now we're going to fast forward to 1983, and he's going to have his trial. First of all, it gets moved. It gets moved because the publicity was uh, so monumental that there's no way, even Judge Sessions uh, recognized that there was no way in the world that he could get an unfair and impartial jury. We had a jury questionnaire. Uh, he allowed us a little bit more dire, and by the time we saw it, everybody in that part of the country knew about Jimmy, and they knew about the case, and they knew about the judge. So he moved us down to Jacksonville, and the reason for Jacksonville was it's in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, so the same federal law applied to Texas and to Florida, and therefore you could rely on the same uh, case law, so it, it made it easy. And understand, so this is, at the time, the biggest federal investigation in history. They say, and, and it varies as to who you want to believe, but some people say it costs more, or uh, it costs the taxpayers more, or more money was spent on this investigation than the JFK assassination. Uh, the figures that I've heard is anywhere from, let's say, $7 million to $14 million. If you set this in the setting in the courtroom, it's on one side of the aisle. This was James. It was David and Goliath. Uh, it was very interesting. I, I like it that way, to be honest with you, because uh, I always like to do cases like that by myself. I have my client and myself sitting on one side of the room, and on the other side, they had at least 10 uh, United States attorneys, strike police attorneys, paralegals. They had dozens of FBI agents. They had dozens of ATF agents. Dozens of DEA agents. They were just milling around and they really looked So the odds uh, were stacked against the, you know, I had another client who said, you know, the United States versus Tony Spalletta, that doesn't sound fair. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's the way he felt. It was the, the, the power and the, the strength of the United States on one side and the, the citizen on the other side. Uh, we were ready to uh, give it uh, uh, the best defense. Um, you know, reference was made before in your video that, that he murdered him. Well, you know, I'm a great believer that if the jury doesn't come back with the guilty, then he's not guilty. You know, uh, uh, you can, everybody can speculate. Uh, Jimmy Shepard never told me that he killed him. But, uh, he always denied that he had anything to do with the killing. You, you and I had a little different bonds. <laughs> we had experience coming up well because you were paying.
jabber, and I'm not going to use any uh, expletives here, but he said, how in the, did your wife say we could win this case? I said, because I'm brilliant. <laughs> single 
original car that was in the parking lot at the time. He was, of course, they took pictures of everything. It had every little louver on the windows exactly as it was. Every door was painted exactly as it was supposed to. I mean, it was a perfect diorama. And the witnesses used that to testify as to the projection of the bullet where they claimed that they saw somebody who appeared to be Harrelson. And all these witnesses were testifying under hypnosis. And I was objecting to that. But it didn't matter. The judge let it in. And they said that he was standing here in this very shot. You know, every once in a while, something good happens to me. And I'm looking at this. And this cost about a million, a million and a half dollars to make this. They left nothing, nothing untouched. And I'm looking at it. And I said, the judge, and he looked at me like, I'm going to bother him now. Judge, I said, can I approach Ms. Burgess? And his clerk's name is Sarah Burgess. Very nice of him. And the judge said, what for? I said, well, I'd like to get some Kleenex. And he said, all right, Mr. Goodman. Remember, the jury's sitting here. I said, fine. So I went up to Ms. Burgess. And she gave me Kleenex. And I said, Ms. Burgess, do you have a magic marker? She looks at the judge because they're scared to death to do anything without the judge saying it's OK because the judge really didn't like me. And she said, judge. And he goes like that. I said, do you have a green magic marker? I'm a little particular here. And she does. And I get up from my chair, go over to the diorama in front of everybody, and I take my little magic marker out. And I start going like this until they were all green. And the judge says, come on, Mr. Goodman. You're holding the jury up. I said, just a moment, judge. And I went up to this wonderful diorama. And they had trees there. And the trees didn't have any leaves on them because they took pictures of the trees in February. But the shooting took place in May. So I start putting my little green Kleenexes all over this million and a half dollar exhibit on every little tree. And the jury's looking and they're saying, what's the government trying to pull on us here? So right off the bat, I knew we really had them thinking that maybe this wasn't the lock cinch that it appeared to be. And then the coup de grace. The government winds up their case. And I had planned to bring in, I had subpoenaed 10 of the toughest murderers, maimers, marauders in the federal prison system. I had subpoenaed them to come to the trial to testify as to my defense. And it's a big deal for somebody to say they killed a federal judge because it gave that person the reputation of import. And I got a phone call from the judge. I have to talk to you immediately, Mr. Goodman. I said, what's the problem, judge? He said, I just got a phone call from Norman Carlson, who's the head of the Bureau of Prisons. And if we bring those 10 guys from Florence and Marion and Leavenworth down to this little jail in Jacksonville, it'll be the biggest escape in the history of the federal prison system. He says, I'm not going to do it. I said, I got it. I have to have these people here. I'm in the middle of a trial. I got to talk to them. So he says, I'll give you Sunday off. And he allowed me to go up to the Atlanta Penitentiary, where all these prisoners have been brought. And I walked in there. And they put me in a room with Mary Lenos. And I only knew one word in Spanish. And I screamed out, avogado, avogado, because they couldn't understand why I was there. And after I got through talking to these guys, they said, yeah, they all said it was a big deal. And it was a sign of being an important person. But they were all a little nuts. And I didn't want to take a chance to put them on the stand. So it came time for my defense. And I went into court on Monday morning. And the judge said, do you have any defense? I said, I do. Well, it started. I said, I called Jerry Ray James. Jerry Ray James was the guy who was the one put into the room next to Chagrin, testified against Chagrin. And I said, Mr. James, didn't call him Mr. I never liked James. I said, James, 
Judge Wood, correct? And you believe in them too, right? Right. No further questions, Judge. And the judge points to the prosecutor on the cross-examination. They're gone like this. They don't understand. Your next witness, Mr. Governor. Paul Finney. In walks Finney. Gets on the witness stand and says, how do you feel? I said, when Mr. Shepard shot you, he looks at me, what are you talking about? Well, he killed you, didn't he? No, Jimmy and I were always buddies. No further questions. And that was my defense. It lasted 12 minutes. And the jury went out and they deliberated for a couple days. And they came back with a not guilty on the two serious offenses. Because I had to concede, basically, the marijuana and the obstruction. There was only significance in the defense didn't work for those. But for the murder and the conspiracy to 